Okay, so I'm going to kind of give you the, the, the intro here. So thanks for coming, guys, uh, to the Eccles Alumni Forum, Consumer NB, Emotional and Financial Impact of Buying Happiness. So I'm Jonathan Miller. I'm a member of the David Eccles Alumni Board. Um, we're lucky to have with us today Dr. Tamara Masters, a professor here at the U, and Cassandra Fuentes. Um, Dr. Mac Masters is a dedicated researcher in consumer judgment and decision making with expertise in influences, persuasion, and psychology of indulgence. Her diverse research methods include field studies, biometrics, VR, machine learning, text analysis, and behavioral lab studies to tease apart the underlying processes of effects she studies holding a PhD in marketing and an MBA in finance from the University of Utah. She blends academic rigor with real world experience. Her research is published in top marketing journals. I can vouch for that, I've read a couple of them. And she has been quoted in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, CNN, and over 150 media outlets. She is also a nature enthusiast from Portland, Oregon, where I used to live before I moved here. Um, she enjoys the outdoors, skiing, music, wide-ranging reading, and with a career spanning industry and academia, she strives to understand why people make consumption choices and to foster student success in business. Okay, and then, um, here, I'm going to flip. Take this paper clip off. So I can read these. Okay. Um, and then we have Cassandra, uh, who also goes by Cass. <laughs> Um, and she's transitioned from social work to the financial services industry in 2010, uh, driven by a passion for helping people achieve their goals. She has a master's degree in education, creates engaging learning experiences for personal finance for Mountain America Credit Union currently. Um, and then outside of work, she enjoys family moments, music, outdoor activities, sharing silly videos of her golden retrievers. <laughs> um, so, uh, there, there's the intro. Okay, so to get this thing started, I just want to set the scene, okay? We've all been there doom scrolling through Instagram or Facebook, and we see our friends living their best lives. One is in Europe, another's in Disneyland, one's at a Major League Baseball game or a concert. Someone bought a new car or luxury item, and we feel it, the desire to have the items, the experiences, the lifestyle of our friends. So this feeling is exactly what Tamara and her colleagues spent time studying. Their findings were released last month in the Journal of Business Research. So, um, so I'm going to kick it off for, with Tamara here. And so I've got some questions that I'm going to ask her to kind of get this thing started. So Tamara, to get us started, will you tell us what Consumer Envy is and what inspired you to investigate the relationship between Envy and consumer purchases in the context of social media exposure. You bet. Um, there's been research coming out about social media and how people feel a lot of envy and how it's unhealthy for some people. And we started thinking, how does it affect purchases? Is there a certain kind of envy that we have termed consumption envy where the, cons the individual sees what the other person has, and they are going to go emulate that. They want to go purchase it now. Um, from a marketing standpoint, that's an interesting thought because it's not just, oh, man, darn, I wish I was doing that. It's, hmm, that looks good. I think I'm going to do it. And that's going to drive perhaps some marketing decisions. And yet we'd seen research that would said, yes, you can create consumption envy. They didn't use that term until we came up with that. Um, that people will want to purchase a product. But sometimes it happens with experiences and sometimes it happens with material goods. Material goods are like a TV, a car, and experiences are like coming here to the forum and everyone's jealous of you because you came to the forum and it looks so fun. Or you went water skiing at Lake Powell and oh man, I want to do that. Um, or went on a vacation that looked like a lot of fun. So our first foray was what creates this envy? When does it occur? And how does it affect people's desire to purchase the same experience or material good? I think I answered your question. Yes. Okay. That's great. Thanks, Tamara. 
Um, <clears throat> so the second question we have is just, can you explain the key findings of your research and a bit of background on the methodology for this? I would love to, and for this, there's a PowerPoint. There we go. We look at Envy, looking at the type of purchase, if it is material good, like this TV that you're seeing on the screen, or if it's an experience good. Oh, let's go ahead. This is the, these are my co-authors and the name of the paper that we put together. This is an experiential purchase, going to the Ute basketball game. How does consumption envy differ between those two? Okay, so in order to determine when does one type of purchase affect consumption envy so that you want to emulate it and purchase the same experience or material good, looking at social media, we found that people were comparing me to another person. So person to person, we call that. Their life is better than mine. They look happier. Um, she is enjoying things more than I am. Those are, ex those are examples of how people term person to person comparison. Then purchase to purchase comparison happens when we hear things like, hmm, that's a better TV than I got, or they got a so much better deal on that EV car. Uh, I wish I had that. Um, that product of some type, that microphone is much better than the one I have. I sure wish I had it. So our prediction was that there'd be greater envy of material purchases if there is purchase comparison. It's purchase, what they bought, the attributes of it, the cost of it, not an experience one. So the type of material is purchase. We expect greater envy. That's why the big arrow going up when people are comparing the purchase to some purchase they have made. On the other hand, if the type of purchase is experiential, we predicted that if they are comparing me to that other person I just saw on social media, which is the natural state that people are in when they're looking at social media, is person-to-person -person comparison, they're going to have greater consumption envy for an experiential good. Okay, so why do we care? Because social media, we know, increases envy experiences. That's what people are posting, and they're posting it to elevate themselves and to share with others how wonderful things are going for them. But yet studies have been showing sometimes it led to an envy that led to purchases and sometimes it didn't. So that's why we teased apart the type of purchase, material or experiential, and if the comparison was person to person or material comparison. So the type of comparison, if you compare me versus you, I expect greater consumption envy. That means I will feel envy about what you have and I will want to go emulate that and purchase it myself. Versus if we can get people to compare the purchase to a purchase that you have made, then there will be more consumption envy of material goods. So it's how things are framed in people's minds. The implications of this work is that it provides a an explanation when we started to find how people are comparing, is it person to person or material good to material good, to describe envy and why that happens on social media or doesn't in certain cases, or with certain media or promotion that companies will do to sell their product. Material purchase increases envy when there is a purchase to purchase comparison, and experience per, experiential purchases have greater envy when there's person-to-person -person comparison. And we did this in numerous different ways and different studies, having people pull down posts from social media that they were most jealous of. And it was experiential. And we put them in a frame of mind. Think of a product you've had and someone has purchased that same product. Think of the price and the features of it. We put them in the frame of mind of material purchase and can create this consumption envy where then they are more likely to go purchase that same material good. Consumption, envy, and purchases can be manipulated by the type of comparison that you are put in. And our default, when we're in social media, is person to person. So that's something to think about, because be careful. <laughs> um, managerial implications is that the type of purchase can be manipulated to increase consumption, envy, and then consumption emulation, that means purchasing 
what you see. But it's also important as consumers that we realize our default is person to person. And that envy in what we're purchasing, we should be aware of it. Um, because sometimes we don't have the finances or it's not the right time to make those purchases, but we're just feeling extreme consumption envy and want to emulate what we see and, and stabilize our inside that is feeling out of balance. And we do that by purchasing. Okay. Thanks, Tamara. Um, one, one more question um, that you kind of maybe covered a little bit on that last slide, but do you have specific examples or strategies that businesses or marketers use to get people thinking about this person-to-person -person comparison that you said is so powerful? We see it's done. It hasn't been done necessarily with this in mind because this is new research that's come out and it's just been defined how it's working with people. But we do see that there are, uh, you'll see the, like a beer ad, and everybody's having a great time, and they're happy, and all their friends love them, and, and they're on top of the world. They're not comparing material good, the actual drink, to another drink. They're doing person-to-person -person comparison to make you want to evoke a sense of consumption envy, and then emulation. That means I will go buy that drink and then I will have fun with all of my friends and they will adore me. Does that sound familiar? So we've seen it um, in numerous different products. There's hair care products, all different TVs, everything. But now we understand what's going on. That's great. Um, I'm, I'm actually, th you've got my wheels spinning just listening to you. For my, I own a small mortgage company, so I'm thinking of ways that I could, you know, advertise accordingly. But anyway, <laughs> um, okay, transition here. So we're going to switch over to Cass for a little bit. Um, I'd like to ask Cass a few questions because purchasing out of envy could have some negative outcomes for individuals who are constantly trying to buy happiness. Um, so let's start with the first question. Um, Cass, what is the relationship between money and happiness? Well, there's, there's definitely a relationship there. We, uh, there's, there's a lot of research on, on that correlation. Um, and, and some of it, as, as time has gone on, you know, we've seen things like, oh, you know, people really just need to have their needs met, and, and that's, the, that's kind of the cutoff. Um, I've seen some specific numbers where, you know, anything over $100,000 is um, going to actually create a sense of dissatisfaction just because there are trade-offs of things like time and travel, you know, the stress that comes with, uh, that can come with that, the increase in um, our, our lifestyle expenses even. So as we, so as we earn money, we have a tendency to kind of level up our lifestyle and sometimes that trade-off, and, and of course, if that's conflicting with your, your finances, that can create some distress. Um, but Matthew Killingsworth from Universal University of Pennsylvania actually said that there is no cap on what you could earn to be happy. Rather, it's more about how are you using that money? Are you using your money in a way that is going to uh, help you feel a sense of fulfillment and satisfaction? Um, and I think that that's a really key thing. That's something that we have based a lot of our, our educational materials on, as well as the coaching conversations that we have with individuals on a daily basis. It's what is most important to you, and how are you using your money as a means to help you become the person who you want to be? Okay, next, next question I've got for you. Um, could you provide strategies or practical tips for individuals to recognize what is driving their spending decisions? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, a lot of that comes back to just kind of stopping and taking note of what's happening in that moment. Um, and sometimes we even have to rewind a little bit and go to, you know, what, what, what happened before or what led up to us making that decision to make that purchase. Um, and I actually love some of the things that you've said because they're they're so tightly intertwined, right? Um, understanding what is it that's driving that. Um, that can happen in a few different ways. That can happen through reflection. 
I actually, um, in one of the, the partnerships that we have, uh, I talked with a gentleman who was like, Cass, how do I stop making those purchases that I regret later? <laughs> I was like, this is a great question because many of us struggle with that. How do we deal with buyer's remorse or avoid it? Um, and, and the guidance that I gave him was, you know, in that moment, right before you make that purchase, give yourself some time to think about what's the underlying thing here. What are my emotions? Do I have a fear of missing out? Or do I feel pressure by some other thing to make that purchase? Um, I think that's a really, it's a really interesting exercise to do. Um, sometimes even things like just giving yourself a little bit of time. Um, I know plenty of couples who, who share money and they say, we have this rule where we can only spend X amount of money without talking to one another first. And there's a couple of things that that creates, number one, that gives you some time to do that reflection and kind of understand. Um, it gives you another party who's maybe not as emotional uh, to kind of help you make that judgment. And then um, really that sense of accountability, right? If you know that you've got to kind of talk with somebody else about that, I think even for me, pers I, I worry a lot about people judging me. So I'm like, ooh, should I say this or should I do this? Um, and getting that, uh, just that insight is is really valuable. Yeah, no, that's good. I mean, she does a lot of really interesting things through Mountain America, you know, some of it involving meditation and the limbic brain, and it's quite fascinating, actually. But um, <clears throat> with the training that, 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 that they do. Um, okay, uh, next question I've got for you, Cass. Um, how can individuals develop a healthy financial mindset that prioritizes long-term financial security and well-being over short-term desires driven by envy. <laughs> I see you laughing up here. <laughs> I want your comments after after I give my spiel. Um, but uh, so I think the biggest thing is all about uh, having your focus on your goals and your values. Um, really understanding again that rather than using money as a means to an end, we want to use it as a tool to achieve our, our dreams, right? And, and that might sound a little bit cheesy, but that when we think about it that way and you start to think about the word dreams, that opens up so much potential and it even, it, it even drives in some intense emotions. And so I think that that's, that's one place to start is to really understand what is most important to you, look at your values, and then start to create goals, financial goals, that will lead you to know that you're, you're living out your values, that you are becoming the person that you want to be. Um, and so that's, that's kind of what we do. Um, at Mountain America, we refer to a model called the why, what, and how. And that's just because we haven't really come up with a better name for it. I think if I were to rename it, I'd call it like the, the financial accountability model. Um, but essentially, it's understanding what are you really after in your life? And then, you know, what are your goals that support what you're doing? And then finally, how are you going to do those things? So what steps do you need to take to achieve those goals? And it's really simple. You can put it in three columns on a piece of paper. Why am I doing this? Or why am I worried about money? Or what am I focused on? And then what are my goals? And how am I going to know that I'm leading that life? And then finally, how am I going to achieve those goals? So I hope that I've explained that to you. And again, it's a really easy exercise. Take 5, 10, 15 minutes to do it it will change your life. Like, I'm s pretty confident in that, <laughs> just based off of the coaching conversations and even, you know, my experience with it as, a, as an individual. That's great. Um, <clears throat> okay, I got a question for Tamara. Um, have you considered any potential ethical concerns or downsides associated with leveraging envy in marketing strategies what are they, and how can companies strike a balance between using envy and maintaining customer trust and satisfaction? <laughs> That's a huge question. Um, when we were finding these results, and that you can frame promotional information as person-to-person -person comparison or material comparison, um, I started thinking, wow, if somebody really was kind of sneaky, they could really use this. And then I thought, well, everyone's already using persuasion and influence already. They just didn't know what it was called. 
because we see something that we want and it has benefit for us. People buy benefits. And so that new car that you want is going to benefit you either because you're comparing yourself to another person who has one and they seem really happy and life is going great for them and the experience of having the car is awesome, or it reduces fossil fuel, you, fossil fuel usage and you feel proud of yourself for reducing your impact on the planet. Those are good things. Um, people still make choices and envy in this situation is not an ugly, mm, there's different kind of envies you can do research on that leads to different outcomes. Consumption envy is one that's just like, man, I really like what they got. I want to get that too. And hopefully they are responsible individuals who will then look at their budget and be mindful and think, can I afford it right now? But we still make those choices. And by just changing color and knowing the, like, Barbie loves hot pink, and so everybody loves Barbie loves things that are hot pink and sweatshirts and stuff I'm seeing all around campus and things that are a little different than they were last semester. Um, because they've seen it and they like it and it just makes them feel happy. Ah, there you go. And <laughs> that's okay, but they probably saw it on someone and thought, oh, I want that, a little con consumption envy. And so they could afford it and they bought it and they felt good. So I talked myself out of thinking there was an ethical dilemma. It's just understanding how people think and what they do. Okay, I'm gonna use some envy in my advertising. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, question for Cass. Um, <clears throat> Cass, what role does financial education and literacy play in helping individuals develop a more rational and informed approach to their spending habits especially when confronted with envy-inducing situations? I love this question, and I might be quite biased because this is like the thing that gives me life. Um, but one of the things that we talk about when we talk about financial education, you know, you guys all probably have heard, you know, income minus what you're spending. You make a budget out of that, right? And we can tell you about the different... Uh, debt repayment methods, all of that stuff. But what I love is talking about things like money scripts. Have you guys heard of this before? Anybody? Okay, good. I'm about to blow all your minds. Uh, so with money scripts, what this is, is this is, are you guys familiar with the term bias? You've heard of bias before? What are biases? It's like attitudes and beliefs about things, right? And we might have explicit bias, things that we know about, we know that we perceive or we believe, but we can also have implicit bias. Things we don't really know, they just, they're just there. Uh, we may not even recognize them. So money scripts is kind of like a bias, but it's specific towards money. And again, we might be aware of them or we may be completely unaware of them. And what I love about financial education is we can bring some of that to light by helping you understand what your money scripts or your attitudes and beliefs about money are. And the cool part is, is when you get into envy-driven spending and you start to understand what your money scripts look like and, and uh, how that influences your behavior, you can think more objectively. And so when we're thinking about, you know, um, I, I want this experience, right? Rather, uh, I dare say that we could challenge that a little bit and say, what is it about that experience and how does that tie to my beliefs about money? And how does that tie back to my values? And I think there is where we kind of get a little bit of the, the powers to start to better uh, influence our financial outcomes. So I think that's really exciting. Yeah, that's great. Um, <clears throat> I might have to check out some of the stuff you've been referencing la later, but um, <clears throat> Kate, question for Tamara. Tamara, not all consumer envy is negative. In your findings, how can consumer envy lead to a positive outcome for consumers? There are a lot of healthy things individuals spend money on, like running. I just did my first 5K. I just did a five, you know, a 10K, and showing their shoes they used, or just that they're out there having a great time. And then you go, wow, I was hoping to be more healthy. I feel 
envious, consumption envy, and I want to emulate them. And then that might drive purchases of a pair of shoes and scheduling time to go running. Um, it's the comparison of ourselves to a state we want to be. That's what envy is. And so that can be very goal-driven and very positive. Um, in fact, I would think a lot of it is. Uh, it just depends on how you use the information you share. Um, that's where some of the bad press has been coming out about social media, particularly of youth on social media having so much envy of other people's situations and not knowing how to attain them themselves. And so that leads to other problems. We're not talking about that kind of envy. We're talking about the envy of individuals who see a purchase or of a material good or an experience and go, wow, I'd love to do that. That looks wonderful. And then deciding whether to purchase it or not. But they're more likely to purchase it if they have experienced consumption envy. OK. Um, good stuff. OK, Cassandra. Um, how can our audience learn more about buying happiness and their own purchasing power? So there are a lot of different books that I've found really helpful. Um, there's there's blogs and podcasts that you can get into in, as well. Some of the most notable ones or the ones that have had a profound impact on me are um, there's a it's a calibrating capital blog. Um, I did not write down his name, you guys, and I was so anxious I was going to do this. <laughs> but he refers to himself as the, the enough guy. If you look up Calibrating Capital blog, you'll find his stuff. Um, but he talks about what does it mean to have enough. And I think one of the things that we have a tendency to get caught up in is the, the grind of do it. we go to work so we can earn money. We earn money so that we can do these things that you know maybe we're seeing other people do, and we're like, wow, I want to do that too. Um, and, and he says, there's got to be like an end to the madness. And so how do we judge what is enough for us? Um, and he goes into detail about that. But that's that's like one of my new favorite things that I've found within the past year or so. Um, and, and using that to kind of gauge where I am in my life. Do I need to be in, you know, a, a high stress, you know, um, a high potential job? Or am I okay kind of being where I am right now and, and having that balance of being able to jo enjoy the work that I have done so far? You know, you guys know this. Um, some of you are probably working full time and you're going to school full time so that you can go and you can get your dream job. Um, and at some point, we've got to be able to stop and kind of live in that and enjoy all that work that we put in. So that's what I love about the Enough Guy. Um, there's another book called Your Money and Your Life, and this is authored by Vicki Robin and Joe Dominguez, and they, there's actually three editions of it now. The first one was back in 1992, but if you want to get into like some interesting, uh, how do people perceive money, and when, when does the uh, happiness seem to kind of have less of an, or when does you know a higher income have less of an impact on somebody, um, that's a fun one to look at, because they, they put some research in that, and then Happy Money, um, by Elizabeth Dunn and Michael Norton. That, if if nothing else, that will inspire you to kind of think about how you're using your money, um, and and even uh, consider investing it in others to help you find some satisfaction and fulfillment. So those are um, those are like the big ones that I recommend to people. And like I said, you can you can search up different things online. You know, how can I find more satisfaction with my money? How can I find um, more joy in that? Uh, and you'll you'll find all sorts of good stuff on there. Yeah, that's great. I'm trying to re remember all this stuff. I should have brought a pen up here later. to write, take some <laughs> notes. Um, maybe we can get some links to that later or something. I don't know how these work. But um, OK, so uh, so that's the end of the questions that I have um, on my script, quote unquote, <laughs> as the moderator. Um, so now we want to open it up to the audience. Um, so I'd like to give the audience a few minutes to ask questions of the panelists. Um, but first, uh, this is an open question to both Dr. Masters and Cass, I guess, that came in during registration. Um, how has consumer envy or emotional purchasing changed over time? Or is there a generational difference in consumer behavior? So if either one of you want to. 
take that? I don't know how it's changed over time because I have not researched it over time. The studies we've done have been done with people online of all different ages, 18 and older, so I don't know how it affects the teen and tweens. But we've, it's, it's robust and it shows up in every group that we've tested and had them check things online or describe things online or, or describe what's making them feel more envy and how likely they are to purchase that experience or that material good. So the effect is there in every demographic, basically, from 18 and older that we've been doing these studies with. And there's a lot of studies. Yeah, she hooks people up to EEGs and does Neuralink stuff. It's really fascinating with her studies, so um, to see how they react to certain things. So pretty cool stuff. Um, okay, so uh, let's see. I mean, we do have some additional questions we can ask real quick before we open it up to the audience because we have plenty of time. Um, maybe I maybe I'll throw a couple of these out and then we'll open it up to the audience. Um, <clears throat> So uh, this is for Tamara. Um, I recently read that more than half of Gen Zers would like to become social media influencers. What role do influencers play in creating consumer envy? And what are your thoughts of being an influencer as a viable career path for young people? Whoa, it's a very viable career path if you are able to be an influencer. But nano influencers, the small influencers that have like 10,000 people or less, they drive revenue for small companies that make a real difference. So it's not viable to think they're all going to be having millions of followers. Um, but if they find something they're really interested in and they're passionate about and can share with people out there, they can be a nano influencer and still have a big impact and have a revenue stream. May not be the 20 million a year of someone else is making, but it could be a very good living. And the question was, before that, I anchored on the end of it. What was the first part of that question? What role do influencers play in creating oh. consumer envy? Um, was the first one. Yeah, that's what it's all about. They're advertising things. They're showing you how much they love them, the new jeans, the new shoes the new hat, the new vacation, the restaurant they went to. It's all about giving a review, and if you like it, then you might feel envious. Just like when you see your friend walks into a room and they've got a new jacket, you go, wow, I love that. That looks so good on you. Where'd you get that? I want to get it too. Uh oh, so you just went through envy and consumer emulation uh, right in that short conversation. Oh, that's good. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'm going to ask a question for Cass. Um, do you have any advice for fostering a more mindful or intentional approach to social media? Um, I, I would say just do exactly that. Be mindful. Remember that social media is generally our curated experiences that we're sharing for some reason. Sometimes it's for validation, sometimes it's that aha moment. You know, you were talking about how we have a tendency to emulate behaviors. And I was thinking, so I'm part of a, a fitness community online and um, in, in the co-founders garage, in the founders garage, um, they have a black wall. Well, I think it's gray now, but you know, and, and they put their, their logo on the wall and, and they've got this decked out gym. And I kid you not, that's where a lot of my money goes is building out this beautiful gym space in my garage. Um, and so and so even I am guilty of that. And the more that uh, the more that people that I follow from that community, the more inspired I am to work out. So what I would say is, first of all, remember that most of these things are curated based on what we react to especially now that we have you know the lo the algorithms that you know kind of keep track of those things. So as you are you know reviewing your your social media, be mindful of what's coming up on there and if it's stuff that doesn't inspire you or make you happy, my opinion is you don't need it. Um, and and even sometimes like the uh, the buying things. So I know for me the marketing really hits me in the emails. But you know I'll be scrolling. Somebody mentioned TikTok in our conversation before this. Oh, I see things on TikTok and I'm like, oh my gosh, I have to have that. 
yeah, if you know that that's a place that's kind of, um, I it's a tempting place for you, maybe, maybe as you go into that TikTok scroll, be mindful of that. I'm not gonna buy anything on TikTok. If I am gonna buy something on TikTok, I'm gonna wait and I'm gonna come back to it at another time. So that, that's kind of my take on social media. I definitely don't have like the research behind it. That's just my personal experience. <laughs> Good, okay, and then I got one question for Tamara. Um, given the rapid evolution of social media and online platforms, how might your research findings adapt or change over time, and how can businesses stay up to date with these developments? Wow, how can my research change over time? It always changes over time, because I get new questions and I see things that are happening. That's how this consumer envy came about. It's like, huh, I wonder. Um, so my research evolves based on what I see happening in the marketplace and um, interesting questions of why did somebody make that decision? What was behind that? And then the second part of your question was... Um, how, how can businesses stay up to date? Mm, how can businesses stay up to date? Read the research that researchers are doing. Read the marketing journals, the research marketing journals. Just the abstract is enough because we get really kind of technical within the body of it, but you can read the condensed versions and um, there's a number of, you can just search, you know, top marketing research journals or marketing research journals and find some abstracts and you'll learn. In the U Magazine, the University of Utah highlights research that's happening across campus and in the business school. And so that's another source of staying up to date. But it's like, in business, you have to keep refining your skills and learning and doing research about what you do in your world because you want to be doing the best and the latest to help your company grow and to help your career, for me, be more fun and grow your career as well. That's, that's great. Um, what are some of the, I guess, the journals that some of the ones that you typically look at, like Harvard Business or what are... That's a good one, as well as mm -hmm. Journal of Consumer Research and Journal of Business Research. Um, you can email me, and I'll give you a list of some that you can look at. Cool. Okay. All right, and then I got one more question for Cass, and then we'll probably just open this up to the audience. Um, Cass, how do you coach people through the emotional toll of buyer's remorse? So we kind of already alluded the way to avoid that buyer's remorse. Um, and I think one of the most important things for us to acknowledge is that we're all human. We might go through and we might set up that why, what, how model and know exactly what we're supposed to do. And some of us will say, you know what, today I don't want to do that. I always refer to those things as future cast problems. Um, and so it's like, I'll deal, I'll deal with that later. I'm not going to worry about that today, right? And and then we find ourselves in that emotional buyer or that buyer's remorse. And we're like, oh, man, I can't believe I did that. I knew better. Um, and so there's a few things that we can do with that. One of them is to just revisit the why, what, and how. Why are we doing what we're doing? We might have to look and make sure. Like most of the time, your values and who you want to be are not going to change. Uh, your goals they might look a little bit different or you might need to take different actions to make sure that you're following through on your goals. And so be open to evaluating those things and say, mm, did I capture that right? And then, like I said, remember that you're human. Give yourself some grace. And whatever you do, don't quit. If those things are really important to you, keep moving forward. There's things that you can do, like you can get uh, like somebody to hold you accountable. Um, Mountain America, we actually offer one-on-one -on -one complimentary coaching. And you don't have to be a member. You can just schedule with us, and we'll talk about what's going on and what you're trying to do. And we can offer, you know, ideas of how to help. We can give you, um, you know, we can be that person to call you and say, hey, I'm checking in. How are things going? What do we need to do differently? What's going well? Um, and and we, can, we can be that for you. But like I said, the biggest thing is just remember the path that you're on and stay focused and... Um, to borrow from my, my community fitness group, more than nothing. Even if you can't do everything or the whole thing today, do do something. Do a little bit more than just not doing anything. That's great. Um, okay, so 
I guess at this point, we'll open it up for the audience. Um, so I'm not sure how we're going to do this. Um, OK. All right. Hi, thank you so much for, for everything today. This has been wonderful. Um, in your research, Dr. Masters, have you seen ever that there's maybe a breaking point for people in terms of consumer envy? Um, kind of where this question is coming from, I was on a trip years ago and I was talking to someone who was also visiting and they alluded to the fact that if they couldn't post the photos of that location, they would have never ever come. And so it seemed like the only reason they went on this really expensive trip was purely to basically have consumer envy for their friends. Um, and at that point, I kind of became so like disgusted by that that I just got off social media altogether. Um, and for me, I think that was the my breaking point in consumer envy. Did you see anything like that in your research or when people maybe got off social media, their buying habits changed? We did not look at that side of the equation. We just looked at what happened with pulling up social media of the people they track or creating social posts and having them respond and seeing how they responded. And when we saw consumer envy and when we saw consumer emulation because of that envy. Um, but that would be very interesting. At what point is the breaking point? I, I, I have something I, I thought might be kind of interesting since we're talking all about social media. It, it'd be kind of interesting to see in here who's on what, you know, these days. Um, I'm just gonna do a quick like show of hands. Who who's who's active on Facebook? And that includes me. <laughs> I'm I'm part of that older generation, I guess. Um, that supposedly is on Facebook these days. I don't know. Um, who who's on Instagram these days? Okay, a lot more people on Instagram. Um, who's on TikTok these days? Okay, not, yeah, the younger demographic typically, right, is what they say, supposedly. I need to get on there myself, I guess, I don't know. <laughs> I've got a young daughter, I'm sure she's gonna, I'm gonna have to figure that out at some point, but is there any other social media that people are using, like, I guess Snapchat is one of them, I don't know, any, anybody else? X, oh, Twitter, that's right, I, how could I forget? Actually, I'm curious, let's, 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 <laughs> Strava's great, yeah. Um, Strava, I'm occasionally guilty of that. <laughs> I'm a mountain biker. Um, but uh, yeah, how many people are on X these days or Twitter? Okay, not not a ton of people. Oh, that's interesting, okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I just thought it'd be kind of interesting to see who's actually on some of these things. I mean, I guess you can get consumer envy from a lot of other things, TV commercials and magazines and billboards and I don't know, lots of other sources too, but. <clears throat> YouTube, oh yeah, YouTube, that's right. My kids are always on YouTube, yeah. <laughs> um, we got a question back there. Hey, this question's for Dr. Masters. I'm curious, your methodology behind parsing out what counts as purchase to purchase versus the person-to-person uh, -person experiential? Because it, in my head, I'm like trying to think of different like posts. Like if someone was standing by a new car they bought, is that, like where does that fall between the two? Experiential kind of was vacations, what they did in the car, who they had with them in the car, how their family had this fam wonderful vacation. Um, material, comparison, purchase to purchase comparison would be uh, bought this car with, it gets zero to 50 in 10 seconds, uses no electricity, and it I had a $5,000 rebate. Boy, I'm just, it's it's awesome. That would be purchase to purchase. So it's written up and the, and the images are quite different between the two. Okay, and just to clarify, you said that like for material goods, the purchase to purchase was more effective? That's Correct. Right. Cool. I just want to clarify that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so someone that registered late last night asked, uh, 
a lot of us have children on social media and a lot of us have like young children that don't have jobs and make their own money yet they're constantly engaging in this and seeing the things that their friends have either the experiences and the fun or the purchase and the actual item the new iphone the new laptop the new computer so how can parents help coach their children in recognizing these emotions and um, that come with consumption and giving them the mindfulness to to prioritize where where they're asking us to spend the money that's actually one of the most powerful lessons I think you can teach your kids um, about money is obviously they're going to learn very quickly that money is a finite resource and if we could we'd put all our money everywhere you know we'd buy all of the diary of a wimpy kid books in my case um, or all of the Legos to add to the already obscenely large Lego collection we have um, but what I've found with kids is when you start to teach them some of these same things, you know, your body generates emotions. This is where we break down and talk about, you know, basic psychology. Here's your limbic system. Here's your gray matter. This is how your decisions are made. And, and as you get older, those, those systems start to work a little bit differently so that you can think more effectively. But for now, right now you're feeling big emotions Why we bring in some of the gentle parenting things. I understand that you're feeling this way and that can be a, an uncomfortable thing to feel. However, you know, and you kind of lay down the facts. Here are some of the things that we're up against. When we're having conversations with uh, our kids about money, we need to be mindful of the money scripts. So remember money scripts we mentioned earlier. These are our attitudes and beliefs about money. Guess where they come from? Our, sometimes, yeah. So there, it's like a mishmash of our parents and our experiences, right? And we, uh, I, I can tell you like so many things my parents used to say about money. Um, then I'm like, oh, that's not quite true for me, right? But I couldn't know that unless I was aware of those things. But we start to give our kids um, that information. We start to teach them money scripts along the way. So we want to be careful about the stories that we're telling our kids. Um, and one thing that I found really effective is um, helping my kids kind of create those financial goals. You can do this in, you know, secondary savings accounts, in your bank account. You can just put names on them. Um, we do it with jars right now because my kids are still pretty young. Um, and so, you know, this morning on the way to school, one of my kiddos was like, I really want that next Diary of the Wimpy Kid book, Mom. And I said, okay, well, he has like 16 or 17. 17 of these already that I've bought for him. And I was like, I'd like you to do some work for it. So, you know, when uh, like when we are ready to do more with this, like I'll give you some jobs that you can uh, do to earn some money and then um, you can use that to buy a book. Do you know what he told me? Well, mom, I have a goal to buy some more Legos. <laughs> I was like, okay, well, this is again where we have those conversations of money is a finite resource and you get to decide, you know, how you want to use that. And the solution that I proposed to him is, you know, I said, there's one of two things that can happen. You can either, you know, split the money that you earn between your two jars, you know, creating one for Diary of a Wimpy Kid and one for Legos. Um, and you can split your money between those or you can put it all towards Legos and, and wait or you can put it all towards the book, right? But really empowering them to make the decisions. And when it comes to kids and money, know that they're going to make mistakes and our goal is to just be there and support them and help them have those conversations and kind of going back to some of the things we've talked about, like understand what the feelings were, right? So when you're talking about phones and laptops, those are a little bit of a harder conversation to have. Um, and I would say, you know, you can use some of these fundamentals, um, helping them earn up the money, even helping them see, you know, here is the cost if it's a thousand dollar iPhone, what else could we do with $1,000? Would you rather do those things or would you rather do this? Um, and that's that's kind of been the way that I've handled those conversations with my kiddos. And it seems to go all right. Like sometimes they're still frustrated, aren't we all? Like when <laughs> we want to take that, that Cabo vacation, it's like, ooh, it's just not in the books this month. <laughs> um, and, and so that's that's part of the reality of it, I think. I, I have the same exact very similar with my kids. Okay, what job are you going to do to earn this? You know, <laughs> trying to teach them a little responsibility and money stuff. But anyway, okay, do we have another one? 
yeah, this one isn't so much a question, but an opportunity for us to put what we've just learned into action. So if everyone wants to take out their phones, snap a picture of the panelists or like at, get one with them after a selfie, tag um, you alumni, Eccles alumni, you business. <laughs> Maybe we can evoke some higher education consumer envy um, for this panel. So I'm not joking, I'm laughing, but I'm very serious. I already, I already <laughs> did my post. It, uh, uh, does anybody else have anything, you know, for, for these brilliant people we have up here on stage? What's trending in your areas? What's trending in your research? What's trending on the part of financial coaching, financial management, those types of things? In my nexus of research, what is trending, it's in the area called neuropsychoeconomics, where we apply biometric measurement with choices people make to understand better what is happening with their chemistry as well as how that's exhibited by the choices they make as consumers. Um, and so I do a lot of research with those kind of measurements as well. But that's not everything in business, and that's not everything in marketing that's trending. That's my little world, and that's what we do as professors. We create a kind of a narrow focus and try to do deep dives into it. Um, so that's not very useful for most other people in the world to know that. <laughs> Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, I mean, I can only speak for what I do as a coach and as an educator. Um, I mean, we, we kind of keep tabs on it. We know right now the economy is kind of all over the place. There are people who believe that we are in a recession. There are people who think we're teetering on the recession. Um, I know for a fact that what the majority of us have all felt the impacts of inflation. Um, and so a lot of the conversations that we're having right now are, you know, how can we how can we be more effective with our spending? And when we get into envy based, what we're, you know, the reality is is that as prices go up for some of those things that we have to have, we may not have as much money for the things that we want to have or our preference purchases. And so um, when we're having coaching conversations, some of that, you know, whether their goals are to pay down uh, debt or to save more or to begin investing, um, we're really kind of helping them figure out what are the things that are most important for them to be spending their money on. And when we connect to those things, like the things that are most important, that's where we find the most happiness and fulfillment um, with, with people's spending. We have a question in the back. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, my name is Stephanie Cooley, and as you have done your research throughout your career, what has been the most surprising or something that has influenced um, your research to make you maybe go a different way? And it's for either one of you. Wow. It's what I see in daily life that makes a difference. I did some studies at uh, the state park where I had a hammer throw and I had a bottle of water was testing a placebo effect and how that would affect consumers. And um, people who valued strength and wanted to have that hammer throw, that you know, the little thing that goes up and goes bing on the top and comes down after you smash it, um, they believed that this drink of water that I had, that just had a wrap on it, and they were given either a wrap that said, this is just regular water, plain mountain water, and the other one said, plain mountain water known to increase the strength of individuals. 
and the people who cared about strength and wanted to hit the top, they hit it harder, statistically, significantly more than people who did not care about it, and so they didn't believe that. I mean, so, and I've done work on heroes and villains and how it affects the price of what we'll spend on different kinds of goods and that kind of thing, hedonic or utilitarian goods. I just find we justify anything we want. <laughs> and so envy just fits right in there when I think of, you know, you want to buy this ice cream bar? It's got a villain label on it. Oh, no, it's got more calories than this ice cream bar over here that has a hero label on it. And it, and I'll pay more for the one that's got the hero label on it because it's a bad good, but if I mix it with a hero, then it's really not so bad after all. It has fewer calories and it tastes better and everything. I mean, I really find that in the measurements. It's amazing what we tell ourselves. I love my job. It's really fun. And so it just, you know, I just see things at the store and I go, hmm, I wonder if, like long receipts, I thought they were just irritating and everyone would hate them. And so I did research on long receipts and I thought everyone would hate it. But it turns out that with a long receipt, people believe they're being rewarded for their effort. And they like the experience and they are planning to go shopping there more than if I just gave them a short receipt with just the dollar total dollar amount. I, and just the things some, that I find out, I just go, oh my goodness, I can't believe this. We are just, we are fascinating people. <laughs> Anyone? Bueller? No? OK. All right, well, we'll go ahead and wrap this up then. Um, so <clears throat> sorry, let me uh, flip real quick to my last thing here. OK. So all right, our time has come to an end. So on behalf of the David Eccles Alumni Network Board, I'd like to thank Dr. Tamara Masters and Cass Fuentes for a fascinating conversation, and a special thank you to Mountain America Credit Union for sponsoring today's lunch um, and today's forum. Lunch is available for our in-person attendees just outside the auditorium there. Um, and then lastly, I hope you'll uh, consider joining us for a very interesting, uh, our next forum on February 1st. So that's coming up around the corner. What is that, about three months from now? A little less than that, two and a half months. Um, at noon, right here in the same uh, Robert H. and Catherine B. Garf building um, at the University of Utah. So Adam Looney, he's the executive director of the Mariner S. Eccles Institute here at the University of Utah. He's going to sit down with the um, chief investment officer for BMO Wealth Management. So that'd be Young Yu Ma, probably mispronounced that. but. Um, <clears throat> That, that should be a very interesting discussion to talk about the economic and market outlook heading into a year of global tension and all kinds of political choices. So registration is now open through the QR code you can see at the bottom of the screen there. Um, I'm sure we're gonna be sending out some emails on that as well um, and some other marketing. Um, so if you could register for that, if you have any interest, that's great. I'm gonna definitely register for that one. Um, and then finally, we'd love to hear your thoughts on today's forum. We will be sending out a short survey. Just take a couple minutes uh, to let us know about today's topic. Any topics you'd like us to, to have in the future uh, would be great. We're, we're could also considering potentially doing one on AI uh, towards the end of March or April. There's a lot of talk about that. Um, so any feedback is greatly appreciated from you guys. So I guess that's it. That's all I got. <laughs>